Our call to worship is from Micah 6, 8. God has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's worship him. Thank you. 
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Jesus. What a beautiful name. Everything we need is in his name. You say in your word that whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Whatever we have need of today, we can go right to the throne room and ask and receive. What other name can do that for mankind? Only Jesus. You are the way, the truth and the life. Let not our hearts be troubled. So beautiful, Lord. We need to expect that you are going to answer our prayer. Without faith, it's impossible to please you. We believe in the beautiful name of Jesus. Yes, yes, we do. And we are ready to receive. Amen. So, Glenn and I are standing outside our dear Salvation Army building here in High Point. And I know both you and I, we can't wait until we get to be inside and enjoy our services inside, in-house. Absolutely. Amen. Now, I understand that today we're starting something new. Yes. What is that all about? We are starting a brand new Kids Corner. Kids Corner, what is that? Yes, the Kids Corner. So in every service that we have online, we're gonna have a short segment where you can tune in and watch and we will learn a small scripture verse that has motions to it. That sounds awesome. Keep watching because today is the first Kids Corner. That's right, and we'll go through a series of 26 with each letter of the alphabet. And at the end, uh, if you know them all, then you'll get a treat.
goodness, welcome everyone. Today we're going to start a new mini-series of scripture memorizations using each and every letter of the alphabet. So each week we will learn a new verse of the Bible that starts with a letter uh, in the alphabet. So obviously the first letter that's the best one to start with, which is the letter A. A. Some of my favorite things that start with the letter A are, let's say, animal crackers, uh, Miss Amy, America, right? So let's find Matthew 7, 7 and see what it says. It starts with the letter A, and so uh, Matthew is in, it says, ask and it will be given to you. So let's say that again with the motions. Ask and it will be given unto you. Ask and it will be given unto you. So keep practicing and we'll see you again for the letter B. Hello, this is Anna Louise McCormick. I just come this afternoon to talk to you a little bit and uh, let you know that I've been missing everybody there. And what I want to say, first of all, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers your telephone call, just thinking about me. Anything you did, you know, whether I, whether I present or just, you know, I know I felt your spirit wherever you were, in High Point or, or in Ashburg. I just thank you for all you had done for the past, let's say about three or four months for me, you know. So that's, this is, I'm gonna tell you a little about what I went through and how the, God came in and touched my heart and, and made a difference in the situation. It was a rough time, but I always held on to the fact that no matter what I was going through, that God was always there. Amen. He was close by me, you know, he never left me. You know, a lot of time I didn't know what was gonna happen. And when you're in a position where you don't know, you know, what the end gonna be, you, you get kind of scared. But yet, seeing that, that soft voice was saying, daughter, you are my daughter, and mm. you are going to be okay. Just keep trusting, just be, and, 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 and everything's going to be okay. And he did. I'm here. I'm a mm. witness. Amen. You know? You know? I, like I said before at the start, he, I went through a lot, you know? And I think now that I have been through that, I got another testimony to tell people, mm -hmm. to tell them how God bought me, what he bought me through. Because I was a sick person for a while, you know, for a whole week I was in that hospital. Nobody could come visit me, did never know the people that would surround me. But you know, God was still there with me. Each and every Amen. day, each and every hour and second. And, and he used the nurses and whoever was around me to show me that, that he was there. Amen. And I and I and I want to thank y'all. You know, I can't, I can't thank y'all enough because I know y'all was praying for me, and I felt those prayers. Mm -hmm. So when you're going through that situation, pray, pray, and God will carry you through, mm -hmm. carry you through the on the mountaintop, in the valley, wherever mm -hmm. you are. God will always be there for you. You just have to keep trusting Him and, and keep going, holding His hand. Mm -hmm. Don't never leave God. Because God will always be there. Amen. You know? Because in my favorite verse, I can't think of the scripture right now, but the one about uh, in Romans, it said, What can separate me from the love of God? Mm. Nothing can separate me Amen. from the love of God. Because he died on the cross for me. Yes. And, I, that you know, who else would do such a thing? He loved me that much. And he loved you too. So when you're going through them bad times, don't worry. Just trust God, and he, and he, and he will bring you through it. Amen. The scripture today is taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, 
there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a way off, his father saw him and had, and had compassion and ran and fell on his face and kissed him. And he said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a, a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to his house, and he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he sang to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, Thou hast killed him for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry, but and be glad, for thy bro for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. The words you are about to experience are true. They will change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you. And He is the Father you have been looking for all your life. This is His love letter to you. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you were my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. 
I offer you more than your earthly father ever could. For I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand. For I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope. Because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore. And I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you. For you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son Jesus. For in Jesus my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. Nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father, and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you. Love, your dad, almighty God. Jolene Horn is a writer for today's Christian Woman magazine. And some years ago, she told about reading her daughter, the prodigal son parable. She writes, while putting my four year old daughter to bed one evening, I read her the story of the prodigal son. We discussed how the young son had taken his in inheritance and left home leaving it up until he had nothing left. Finally, when he couldn't even eat as well as pigs, he went home to his father who welcomed him. And she continues to write, when we finished the story, I asked my daughter what she had learned. After thinking a moment, she said, never leave home without your credit card. That would be one way to try to make it work. I'm sure that some people wish it was that easy to leave the father's house, but it's really not that simple. The results of living away from God are always disastrous and nothing can prevent the ultimate consequences from catching up with us. The reason is that God's ways are the way of life and joy. And the way of rebellion is the way of self-destruction and ruin. The further away we run, the worse the destruction becomes. As exciting as the outside world appears, the Father's house is where real life and love are experienced. The world is the illusion. The Father's home is the reality. 
Let's take a look at the three main characters of the story and see if we can learn something about ourselves and our Heavenly Father. First, let's look at the Father in the story. The Father represents God, our Father. Maybe you are surprised that God would act like this Father. He doesn't do anything to stop the Son from taking advantage of Him. He does not lecture Him or warn Him. He doesn't even try to keep Him from leaving home and engaging in behaviors He knows will be destructive to the young man's life. The Son is allowed to do anything He wants to. When he asks for the estate to be settled before the father's death, which by the way is the ultimate insult in that culture, the father doesn't object. He simply gives him what he would, that which he would eventually uh, have come to him uh, later on in life. You see, in the culture of Jesus' days, children simply did not leave home, not even when they got married. When his son got married, the father uh, simply added on to the house, and the son and his new family would live in that same property. To leave home would have been to leave everything, your extended family, relationships, work, future. So for someone to even suggest that he would leave, let alone ask for his share of the estate, Something that normally would happen after the father died. Well, not only would that have been a risky thing to do, where would you go? But perhaps more importantly, it would be an enormous insult to your father and your family. But, did you listen to what I said a minute ago? The father in this story represents God, our father. One of the disturbing things about God, for some people, is His refusal to step in and stop us or others from doing what is wrong. He has a non-interference policy. So, and sometimes we hear people say, why doesn't God do something about the evil in the world? Why doesn't He stop people from hurting other people or doing evil things? Well, you see, God has given us the awesome gift of free will. If He interfered in any way, it would no longer be free will. We think we would like God to be more controlling, that is, when it comes to other people, right? We would like to have God force other people to do the right things and stop other people from doing wrong things. But when you and I want to rebel, we don't want anyone trying to control us. So, God knows that the moment He forces us to do His will, it is no longer we who are obeying, and therefore it means nothing. It, uh, if following and obeying God is something that happens because we are forced, then it is pointless. If we do God's will willingly from the heart, then we delight the heart of God. The father in the story did not want his son to stay home if the son did not want to stay home. He did not want him to be there out of some kind of obligation. And the father certainly did not want his son to be there just waiting for him to die so that he could get his hands on the inheritance. The father did not agree for the son to leave out of weakness. He was not just being a lenient or compassionate parent. He was giving the son what the son thought he wanted, in the hope that someday he would want something else, something better. Only if he saw the emptiness of living away from the father would he want to return to the father willingly. Only if he experienced what it was like to be away from the Father's love would be the desire for that love to begin to grow. In the story, the Father does not go looking for his son in that distant country. He would not rescue him against his will. 
It is interesting that the two short parables that come before the prodigal son is quite the opposite. In the parable about the lost sheep and the parable about the lost coin, Jesus encourages the listener to stop what they're doing and go look for the lost sheep and the lost coin. But not so in the parable of the prodigal son. The father allowed his reckless son to go and discover for himself that the world is not that great and wonderful place it seemed to be. In his search for pleasure, pain would instead be the young man's constant companion until the images of the world's temptations were replaced by the images of a home where he was loved and valued. We can look at this story and see the foolishness of this young son. The mistake of, uh, of his way is so clear and we can see the result of his destructive lifestyle before they even come about, because we've read it. But when you are in the middle of that situation, it is not so easy to see. The world looks so appealing and people seem so free and having such a good time. You think you're invincible and you are immune from destruction that takes place in other people's lives. You are smarter than they are. Those things will never happen to you, but they do happen to you. What goes around comes around. Did you know that that's actually biblical? What, comes, what goes around comes around? You find it in Galatians 6, 7 to 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. The wise person accepts that truth and lives their life accordingly. The foolish person insists on testing that truth by experience before they will believe it. That is what the young son did. One thing that we start understanding as we continue to read the story is that the father has been looking for the son all along. The reason the father let him go was not because he did not care. He's been looking and he's been longing. Every day, it seems, he checks the horizon for some sign that his son is on his way back and home. And then, one day, the father realizes that the figure that is coming and immediately takes off running, he can hardly wait to throw his arms around him. There is not the slightest hint of a lecture or ridicule. There is no guilt trip. Neither is there talk of the pain that the son has caused or the debt he owed. There is only joy that the son has returned home of his own free will. The second person in the story is the son himself. Let's look into the minds and hearts of this young man who decided to leave home. We see this happening so often. A young person has parents who care for him or her, but they cannot wait to break free and be on their own. Their parents want the best for them, but they see their lives as restricted and controlled. The world looks really exciting and they get tired of hearing their father or mother talk about the dangers and the wrongness of what is going on in the world. But when they leave, Pain will be their constant companion. They will look for more and more ways to dull the pain. They will try everything. They will think of everything. Everything except the thing which is a cure for the pain. They will go everywhere. Everywhere except home, where they are loved and valued for the person they are. It is interesting that this young man thought he was on his own. It says that he's squandered his wealth in wild living. It's like he was telling himself, it's my life and my money. But it was not his wealth. 
he would have had to work a lifetime to get that much money. So actually, he was living off his father's resources the whole time. He was squandering his inheritance and throwing away that which was intended to provide him with the future. He wasn't really on his own at all. Everything he was doing was made possible by his father. The prostitutes and parties were paid for out of his father's pocket. But isn't that true of all of us? We use the resources our Heavenly Father has given to us to rebel against our Heavenly Father. We say, it's my life and my money. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? God has given you a life, a brain, freedom, prosperity, health, athletic ability, a good home or good looks. And what have you done with the Father's gifts? Have you squandered his resources or used them in the way the Father intended that you might have life and have it to the full? Do you see that? It's a gift. Jesus tells us in John 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they, you and me, might have life and have it full. Friends, we can have a full life and it's a gift. The worst part of this young man's life is not that he went away to the far country and spent the father's resources in sinful living. No, that's, that's not the worst. The worst part of this young man's life is that he never developed a relationship with his father. If he had, he would never have left home. He did not understand how much his father loved him. He, did not, he didn't understand that what was available to him at home was more than all the pleasure and money in the world. He would not understand that his father wanted the best for him and had great plans for him. We might be tempted to blame all this on the father, but remember, that the Father in the story represents God. He is perfect in his love and wisdom. If the Father had been controlling and manipulative, he would never have let the Son go in the first place. But this young man rejected his Father without reason. He had lived with him all those years and never knew him. He did not understand all that the Father had planned for him. He was on his way to ruin his life and would, have, and would have if he had not come to his senses. He had lost his rightful mind. He had become morally and spiritually insane. But he finally came to his senses. That began when he, when he decided to admit his stupidity and sinfulness. He decided to go back to his father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Friends, that's all it takes. And when we come to the, that place of asking for forgiveness, we too are ready to go back home. Now there is the third person in the story, the other son. He was the oldest. He was the good boy. He never left home. When his father asked him to do something, he did it. He never rebelled or ran away. He couldn't stand his sinful brother. He fully expected to be the head of this estate and to inherit everything that was left. Of course, now there was a significant hole financially in the estate, since his father had given half of it away to his foolish younger brother. The older son was happy that his younger son was gone. It will be easier now. He probably felt a little big-headed. He had been the obedient son, and he deserved all this. He had earned it. 
There was just one problem. There was something that the older son had in common with his younger brother. He never actually got to know his father. He had not really developed a love relationship with his father. He was obedient and faithful. He worked hard and was dependable. But he did what he did because it made him feel proud of his own accomplishments rather than out of a sense of love for the father. And when the father showed that he still cared for his disobedient brother, the older son became angry and bitter. He looked at it as the ultimate injustice. He accused his father of being wrong. He made his father out to be unfair. He thought that he was the one who deserved a party, not this troublemaker who smelled of pig fertilizer. He talked to his father like he was stupid and intentionally wrong in his judgment. He charged him with favoritism. He didn't understand that it was not about who had been given, who had been good, uh, had been bad. It was about who was dead and now was alive. It was not a matter of who was deserving. It was about who was in need. But the, other, but, but the older brother's concern was about justice. And he never understood that his father's concern was about grace. Perhaps you and I are like the older brother. When it's easy to become bitter and angry that parties are being thrown for those who were out in sin and just stepped into the Father's house. It almost rubs us the wrong way that Jesus said, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Luke 15, 10. Yes, but is there rejoicing over someone who doesn't need to repent, we say? But, but we're not playing good boys, bad boys, or good girls, bad girls. We are involved in a spiritual struggle of life and death. Someone who was dead has found life. And it is fitting that we rejoice. You see, Jesus originally told this story to show there is hope for everyone. And that it is not a question of whether we deserve to be in the Father's house. Because the truth is that none of us do. Jesus was contrasting the faithful religious people of that day to the sinners who were turning to God. The point was that neither of them had a relationship with the Father, in spite of all the religion in some of their lives. The point was that one group had come to their senses and returned home to establish, to establish a relationship with the Father from whom they had been alienated. The religious folk, instead of rejoicing, were annoyed. They were angry and bitter. In their minds, they deserved God's favor, but they had never really experienced the Father's love. Have you ever wondered how this story ended? In the Bible, the story ends with the older brother coming home and he hears music and dancing, but he did not step inside. Instead, he called for his father. And the last we read about the story is the father having a conversation with the older brother. And the father is saying, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Do you think that the older brother joined the party? What do you think happened after the party? Perhaps the story ended with the young son, the reckless one, who had rebelled, coming back home to become a servant. After all, he had spent his inheritance and he didn't deserve anything else. He would serve his father and then his older brother when the father passed away. 
he would live the rest of his life as a hired servant, just as he said. But the father in the story puts a ring on his finger and a special robe on his back. He throws a party. So it becomes obvious that the father has other ideas and has no intention of making him a slave. Or perhaps an alternative ending would be that the older brother finally gave in and forgave his younger brother. He shared the inheritance with him and they both lived in the father's house as brothers once again. But the story is that the oldest son did not come inside the house. There is singing, drinking, eating, dancing and partying. But in verse 28, the Bible says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. The father even went out and pleaded with him, something he had not done with his younger brother. But the older brother was outraged. He refused to be reconciled to his brother or his father. So maybe the most likely ending to the story is the older brother became increasingly bitter against the father and left the house. And the younger brother inherited everything. This is exactly what happened historically. Those who wanted to deserve God's favor by their obedience rejected God's grace and a relationship with him built on grace. They became bitter against the father and accused him of wrong. They rejected Jesus, the incarnation of God's grace. They hated Jesus for loving sinners and attending parties in their homes. And in their hatred, they killed him, thinking they would inherit everything. But in so doing, they lost everything. And the kingdom belongs to Christ. And those who have followed him into the Father's house, where there is feasting, singing, and dancing. What I would like for us to learn today with the story of the prodigal son is that we should have a relationship with God. We need to have a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. God will always grant that you and I have free will. He's never going to force himself on you. But God will always be available for you. And he's longing to be with you. He absolutely, positively wants to live in you. Just like the father in the prodigal son story, God is looking for you. And when he sees your silhouette down there on the road, when you return home, he will shout out loud and call all the angels and say, look, there is one of mine coming back home. Let's have a feast, party. Let's celebrate. Are you one of those prodigal son types? Perhaps you're not lost in the world in deep sins like the one in the story. Uh, there may hopefully not be prostitutes and wild parties involved in your life. But yet, you're not home because you are still to experience and develop that loving relationship with the Heavenly Father. Maybe you need to hear that prayer that Jesus is praying for you. The song that Inger started to play is a song we had last week. It's found in the Salvation Army Songbook number 264. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me.
Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you are indeed our Heavenly Father. Lord, we understand that you want to have a relationship with us. And so often we take this relationship too lightly and we think that what we want is our freedom. We don't understand that freedom is not freedom without you, but with you, O oh Lord. So today, it is my prayer that all who are watching this right now will be drawn closer to you. Help us to hear your soft and tender voice calling us home. Come home, you say to us. Father, we love you and we want a closer relationship with you. Amen. Receive the benediction. May the love of God the Father fill our hearts and minds, and may His embrace hold us when we feel unworthy to be called His children. May the friendship of Jesus, our companion, rid us of any notion that we are nothing, and may we find our home with Him in His kingdom. May the spirit of life release us from a world of duty so that a new joy wells up in our lives. Let us go and reconfigure the world in our friendships, in our workplaces, in our families, in our streets, and in our world. Go proclaim the story of our Christ serving in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. People of God, be encouraged. In spite of what you're going through, this is an opportunity for us to send a little hope your way. No matter what it is, the struggle, no matter what's happening, you be encouraged. Let's do it. Here we go. Woo!
bless you. Hallelujah.